It is the doctrine concerning the contradictions of God, let's call it. The contradictions of God. If you study this, this is going to be very eye-opening in everything. Now, if you studied my basic discipleship videos, I gave you one of my most favorite and most important teachings to me. It was called the balance and attributes of God. But this is a branch from the contradictions of God. All right. The balance and attributes of God. This is found at the book of Isaiah. Oh, well, not at the book of Isaiah. We'll ignore that part. But we'll see right here that in the Bible, that in the balance and attributes of God, I gave you many scriptural verses of God's attribute. For example, the book of Hebrews says that God is a consuming fire. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. But then you look at the book of 1 John, and it says God is love. So there seems to be a contradiction here. But what solves the contradic contradictions is to understand his attributes are in perfect balance of each other. That will solve all the verses, problematic texts that you will find concerning about God's nature and God's working. Anything God does that seems a contradiction, you got to think about this. I wonder if there's another part of his attribute. So this one will solve a lot concerning the so-called errors in the King James Bible. Atheists, their favorite move is to find contradictions. They will always do that. They're going to try to find errors in your King James Bible where there are contradictions. But if you study this doctrine here that I'm going to show you, it's going to solve perhaps all problematic text or so-called verses that are in error, so-called in error. The first thing is think about this when they try to pull up a contradiction. Ask yourself this. I wonder if there's another attribute of God at play, which is why there's a contradiction. Okay, so here's an example concerning that. God's a consuming fire. So hellfire is eternal and forever. But doesn't that contradict his nature of love? I thought God is 100% love. Well, here's the idea. The simple answer is they have to be attributes in balance. So he is 100% love and 100% wrath. He is not 50% love and 50% wrath. That is wrong. Has to, what is a more perfect, scary, fearful wrath than burning in hell for eternity? Yeah. Nothing's more scarier than that. Yeah. Nothing's more scary than that. Yeah. What's a more perfect 100% love than Jesus dying on the cross and you say you don't have to do any Amen. single work Amen. whatsoever Amen. and you're eternally secured, you don't have to live in fear. Once saved, always saved, O-S-A-S. So then that's no greater love. And see, that's in balance of each other on a scale. Yeah. They both have to be 100%. If one is 90%, 10%, then there's a contradiction. All right, the second thing concerning the contradictions of God. And by the way, the contradictions of God is one branch of biblical hermeneutics. So uh, this is all just one branch. So I'm kind of excited to teach you at Advanced Discipleship one day. Woo! How long will that take, Pastor? Give it a year, okay? <laughs> Give it a year. But, hey, we're enjoying intermediate discipleship, aren't we? All right, so. All right, but number two... Another thing is dispensationalism. This is perhaps a separate branch, but this is a part of the contradiction of God. Dispensationalism is by itself biblical hermeneutics, I believe. But I included this because this will be part of the contradictions of God. So 2 Timothy 2.15, read that. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly what? Dividing the word of truth. So the verses have to be divided. So you might ask, what is dispensationalism? Dispensationalism, what that simply means is rightly dividing verses to the right group of people and the right time period. So then I'll, I will make this simple with a chart. And for some of you who watch me for a long time, you've seen this, you see me draw this like over and over again. 
So, if you divided in, now we believe that there are more different timelines, but I'm just going to make this simple. So mainly and simply, there is tribulation, church age, and Old Testament. And then here's Jesus dying on the cross. So then when you see verses in the Bible, Acts 2.38, for example, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. But then you look at Paul's writing at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Wait a minute, so is baptism part of salvation or no? The simple answer is this. You look at the group of people and the right time period. You got to realize that are they re referring to the group of people called Jews? And if you look at the majority of your Bible, you'll notice that the attention is on Israel, Jews. That is very interesting. When you think like that, this is going to solve many things that you got questions on concerning the Bible. What about verses that talk about works and losing your salvation? You'll see it'll refer to Old Testament Jews or in the tribulation Jews. What about verses where it says uh, not just works for salvation but losing salvation? Old Testament Jews, tribulation Jews. What about Levitical diet, laws, uh, abstaining from meat? Well, Paul says that you can eat meat. So then, is there a contradiction? No. Christians under Paul, we're allowed to eat meats. Old Testament law, you're not allowed to eat meats. Sabbaths, they make a big deal about the Sabbath. But that is for Old Testament Jews under the law. Christians, Paul said, that the Sabbaths no longer apply to us. Seventh-day Adventists, who are a lot more clever, they will say, no, it's not just Jews. If you look at it in your Bible, it says that Gentiles observe the Sabbath. Ah, the time period is the millennium. And God's headquarter is the Jews. That's why Gentiles, they all have to turn to the Jews. Yeah. Why? Because God will rule over Jerusalem. Yeah. Makes you more careful when you study conspiracy and attacking Jews. Yeah. Makes you more careful on that. They're still God's chosen people. Why? Because they're, they're still God's chosen people. Where they're so evil. And you're not. Come on. Amen. And you're not. Amen. You know what God's going to do? He's going to set them right, just like he's setting you right. Yeah. So Amen. trust me. If you study history about the Jewish people, I think the Lord has been very, has dealt with them. You notice that group of people compared to all other nationalities have been treated very hard by all other different nations. So I think the Lord knows what he's doing. Okay, but anyways, so this will solve a lot of contradictions. A group of people, time period. That's why water baptism was practiced by Jews. Signs and wonders, speaking of tongue, healings, visions, it was for the Jews. The Christians, it was all under salvation by faith, the word of God. That's why we don't need all these physical things like Jews have, physical days to observe, physical works for salvation or you lose salvation, physical uh, things that you have to do according to the law made for physical man. Uh, physical water that's required for baptism for your salvation. You see this? These are all Jews who are a physical nation from God. But Christians, they're not a physical nation from God. They're a spiritual nation from God. That's why we go by the spiritual word of God. Okay, so this is very eye-opening, is dispensationalism. Another one concerning about the contradictions of God is concerning, now this one is going to be very helpful, and I'm not going to put all the contradictions of God for time's sake. We ran out of time, so I'm just going to put out the main ones. The simplicity of God versus, oh, I had it written here. Let's go to the book of 1 Samuel, please. Let's look at the book of 1 Samuel. So I wrote this in my notes. We're going to look at the book of 1 Samuel. And then we're going to look at the... Chapter uh, 29, please. Chapter 29. The strictness. Simplicity versus the strictness of God. What does that mean? Okay, notice right here. Here's an example. We're going to look at 1 Samuel chapter 28, verse 17. And the Lord hath done to him as he spake by me. Now, this is David speaking to King Saul. Uh, excuse me. No, 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 no. This is Samuel speaking to King Saul. What does Samuel say to Saul? For the Lord hath rent the kingdom out of thine hand 
and given it to thy neighbor, even to David. Now, here's the problem, though. Saul is still king. But Samuel said, no, David's already king. No, David's not king yet. What does that mean? So the idea is this. The idea is that informally, Saul's kingdom was already finished. But formally, it's still Saul's kingdom. This is very important to understand. God, he is not for complexity. He likes to go by simplicity. You know why? Because uh, look at the book of 2 Corinthians, I believe, 13. Paul said, I marvel how Satan, through his subtlety, drew you away from the simplicity that is in Christ. God likes to speak in simple terms. So, in sim simply speaking, yeah, God is done with Saul. He's not using it anymore. You notice throughout the entire book of Samuel, he's focusing on David, right? But that doesn't mean that David is, strictly speaking, officially, formally king. Uh, this will solve a lot of co so-called contradictions as well. For example, there are plenty of verses in the Bible that mentions that a certain king of Judah ruled for a certain amount of years. But then, in another verse, it says that the same king of Judah ruled a different amount of years. And these year numbers don't match up. Let's say one is 10 years and the other says 20. And if you look up in your Bible, it does say that. And those are favorite passages used by atheists. You know what the simple answer is? Unofficially, he did rule for 20 years, but officially he only ruled 10. That's a sample. See? So you got to look at the strictness and the simplicity. Sometimes you got to realize this. Our God is a strict God to the T, especially if you look at the law of Moses. He gives you detailed on measurements and proportions and certain types of sacrifices. But you also got to understand our God does not live every day where you tear your hair and you live a complex, paranoid freak. He likes to be simple at times. Here's another easy example. So concerning about the contradictions of God, another very eye-opening case is concerning about, let's call this multi, I'm going to use the liberal term. Liberals recognize a multicultural perspective. But this is one thing they overlook. Why don't you include God's culture here and not just man's? So let's call this God's perspective. So here's a, one example concerning a contradiction. The Bible says that... Uh, God prepared a great whale to swallow up Jonah at the book of Jonah, chapter 1 and chapter 2. But Jesus Christ call, uh, called it a big, uh, Jesus called it a whale, excuse me. And then the book of Jonah, chapter 1 and 2, called it a great big fish. So Jesus called one whale, but then Jonah called it uh, a fish. Now, in scientist terminology, oh, that's an error in your King James Bible. A whale is not a fish, it's a mammal. Well, guess what, dummy, okay? Don't you see people calling, seeing a whale? How many times you see a person saying, look at that big fish over there? Yeah. Now, you got to understand this. I thought you're a multicultural perspective. Yeah, come on. They recognize that, that a different culture may see your view as something different. So we as people have to be understanding of that person's perspective. So you got to do the same thing with God right come here. On. I thought that you brag about being tolerant with all religions. Why aren't you doing that with the Bible? Wow. Katcha. Katcha. You're not so liberal now, are you? Now, here's the thing is that this will be very eye-opening on the contradictions of God. So think about this. What is it in God's eyes and perspective? Because you've got to realize this. Mammal was not invented by scientists during the B.C.'s. Oh, we call it a mammal this way. you got to realize, what did they think that time period? What did God think of it at that time period? Your God is not a biologist in the lab using science terms in your Bible. That's why the big controversy is Noah's Ark used by evolutionists. Got two kinds of animals in the ark. What is the, what's the kind? Is that a species, you know, in scientific terms? You dummy, God's not thinking like that. 
God is not thinking some certain classification category in your zoology, biology, and all these kind of ologies in your science. He's looking at simply, I'm seeing two different kinds, uh, two different kinds of animal right there. Doll, okay? A cat is a different kind of animal from a doll. We're not going through species of different dogs and different cats. So you gotta realize this, look at God's perspective. Do you think that the classification system of biology was, in, was there during Noah's flood that time? Well, Noah, here's the classification system right here that I want you to follow. Cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo. For a PhD scientist, they, don't have, uh, they have rocks for brains, man. Because they came from a rock, I guess, right? We all yeah. came from rocks, okay. <laughs> Anyways, so this will be very eye-opening. So simplicity versus strictness. Multicultural perspective, but more accurately, God's perspective, let's call it. That's more accurately called. And then for our time, oh man, there's so much. I got to wrap this up. Okay, so there are two things I'm going to say quickly, which I won't draw. The last thing that I want to talk about concerning the contradictions of God, which is very eye-opening, is not just concerning simplicity versus strictness, but this one, but this is called rules and exceptions. Rules and exceptions. People who attack dispensationalism, including its dispensational salvations, they mock that system. But when you mock that system, you are mocking God. Because in the Bible, there is no doubt there is such a thing called rules and exceptions. For example, uh, Hebrews 9.27 says, As it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. That's the general rule. But guess what? There's an exception. Enoch. Yeah. So Enoch did not see death and God raptured him. Elijah as well. Why? Because you have to look at why God gave the exception. You got to realize this is that our God, he does lay out rules, but he realizes this. rules are there to keep people in line. And there are, you got to realize this, there are exceptional circumstances. So because there are exceptional circumstances, you have to lay out exceptions. Don't you do that? Yes, we all do that, whether you like it or not. If you liked, if you tell me I never laid out an exception before, you're a liar. I bet you in your life that you laid out an exception to somebody because you understood the person's predicament situation. Yeah. So a great example is concerning dispensational salvation. For example, uh, God mentioned that uh, you have to follow the works of the law for your salvation. That was Old Testament Jews not Christians. Christians were saved by grace. So the rule for Old Testament salvation was following the works of the law. However, God gave exceptions. Why? Concerning David's case. David, he committed adultery and murder. According to the law, the works of the law, you were to be put to death. But God gave David a, an exception. Nathan the prophet said, the Lord overlooked your iniquity. Why? Because David's case was exceptional because God knew David had a tender heart, that he get right with God, that he repent, and that he had a record of living well for God. So then God gave David an exception right there. Another thing concerning rules and exceptions is King Hezekiah. He had to cleanse the people before they partook in a Jewish feast. That was the Levitical law. But then God had to give an exception to Hezekiah. Hezekiah said, would you just automatically cleanse your people, God, even though we didn't, we didn't have time to follow the law? And the Bible says God cleansed the people. Yeah. Rules and exceptions is the fifth one. The sixth one, which is a no-brainer. And if you follow this, ever since the beginning of your Christian life, you would have no problem with errors in your King James Bible. The book of Isaiah, God said, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. You know what the simple answer to all of these contradictions of God is? You're too stupid and you're too dumb. There's your answer. If you recognize as a human being that I'm too dumb and too stupid, I can't comprehend why God did it this way, but he's 10,000 times smarter than me, so I'll just follow what he says. Oh, I don't believe in that. Well, you're dumb enough to listen to your professor at school with all these terminologies, and then you have to memorize them, and you don't even fully understand its workings, and you scientists go by theories, and you just have faith in all that kind of stuff. You have so much faith in yourself, in the weakness of your flesh, and how many times has history proven your intellectual ability wrong, mankind, sir? How many times? And how many times was God proven wrong throughout history? Not once. This word of God was preserved forever. 
There is no other manuscript evidence numbering the thousands that supported evidence than the Bible. Not even one book. No science textbooks, no technological work, and not the Quran, not the Bhagavad Gita, not the Book Amen. of Mormon. Amen. It was right here, your King James Bible. So if you recognize that fact that God is just much smarter than you and he has a reason why and you take it by faith, then you will be fine. This is a great doctrine and one of my uh, favorite teachings of tonight or my most favorite Amen. teaching tonight is the contradictions of God. And I'll hopefully teach you more as time passes Amen. by.